during these uh, uh, moments together, we've had this special guest be with us on each occasion, Mr. Rodin's uh, The Thinker, and I've mused as we've gone along over uh, what it is that possibly has him so absorbed continuously in such deep and provocative cogitation. And I, uh, I think I know the answer. Uh, during uh, the uh, interim between the last lecture and this lecture, I had a private conversation uh, with the statue, and he revealed to me the subject matter of his heavy concentration. He said he's been thinking about the Beatles. <laughs> Not the musical Beatles. <laughs> Rodin doesn't have time for that. But rather, the bugs that we call Beatles. And the thinker was pondering this question. Do beetles, Japanese beetles, whatever kind of beetle is your favorite kind of beetle, he said, do beetles have consciences? Do beetles commit crimes against other beetles? Are there beetle courts and beetle prisons? This is the kind of speculation that, that the artist has caught now and immortalized in stone. Now, of course, I'm teasing, but the question is not a joke. Do other creatures in this world struggle with questions of guilt and of justice? Do other creatures in this world struggle with matters of righteousness? Do beetles care whether other beetles behave in a morally appropriate way? Or is the subject of ethics and morality uniquely a human concern? There are those who are convinced in our day and age that ethics should be as important to us as it would be to Beatles, and no more, because we are nothing but more sophisticated garden variety Beatles. Again, our anthropology determines ultimately our ethics. How we view the importance of humanity will have tremendous influence on how we behave. It's that simple. Now, as I've used the, the blackboard on various occasions, I keep walking past these bookcases, and I promise you that uh, uh, none of these books were placed here as stage props or any of that like, but my eye keeps falling on on this little book here, which is a leather-bound edition of C.S. Lewis's immortal work now called Mere Christianity. As many years as Lewis has been dead, this book still sells over 100,000 copies every year, in the English, just in the English-speaking world, Mere Christianity. It's a book that, in simple terms, set forth the central claims of the Christian faith and has been useful, particularly among college students and intellectually oriented people to give them an, an, an initial uh, presentation of the cardinal tenets of Christianity. And as I was just leafing through this for old time's sake, I noticed the title of the very first chapter. It reads, Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe. Right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe. It was Dostoevsky who said, pondering the pessimism of his age, of those who had declared the death of God, as he pondered the implications of that, Dostoevsky said, if there is no God, then all things are permissible. Immanuel Kant, who, who uh, in many regards dug the grave of the classical defense of Christian theology, in spite of his agnosticism with respect to proving the existence of God, Kant declared in his final writings, practically speaking, as I mentioned before, we must live as if there is a God. And though Kant banished God from theoretical thought, 
in his critique of practical reason, he went around to the back door of the house, and where he banished God out the front door, he went around and opened the back door and ushered God back in on practical grounds. He said he, he, his argument for the existence of God was not theoretical, not rational, not empirical, but moral. Kant argued in this fashion, for ethics to be meaningful, this is a simplified shorthand version of it, for ethics to be meaningful, there must be justice. That is, before anybody has a right to say, you must, you ought, or you should. And everyone in this room has said that to somebody else, you ought to do this. And you've all heard people give you rules and regulations. God said, before any of that can possibly be meaningful, there must be justice. Why? Because if there's no justice, why should we be concerned about doing what is right or doing what is wrong? Who cares? He went on to argue that we can look around the world and we can see manifest injustice. We can see people who are rewarded who don't deserve to be rewarded and people who are punished and afflicted though they are innocent. Some even cry out in despair, there is no justice in this world. Well, that's not altogether true. There is some justice, but I doubt if anyone in here would think there's enough justice in this world. And if justice is thwarted at any point, Kant says, why should we be concerned about ethics? So he says, there has to be justice. He said, well, what would there have to be for there to be justice? Well, there'd have to be a judge, and the judge would have to be just, and the judge would have to be omnipotent, and all the rest, and he'd have to be righteous himself, and we would have to survive the grave in order to go to a place where there is justice. And by the time Kant's finished on his practical argument, he's constructed almost the whole of the Christian faith with a God who is just, who promises a last judgment, and holds every human being accountable for every action that we perform. But remember what he said. he said. He said, that doesn't prove that God exists. Only, he is saying, that it, it proves the necessity of the existence of God for ethics to be meaningful. And if ethics are not meaningful, somehow, Kant said, society ultimately becomes impossible. 